Welcome to our spring series of our Leadership Unplugged series, which is a program of the Leadership Maine, a program of the Maine Development Foundation. I'd like to thank our series sponsor, uh, be before we begin, Bangor Savings Bank, uh, which has uh, sponsored this spring series and a very strong supporter of MDF and a Champion Circle member. Uh, we appreciate that. Through our membership, we are able to do these things and able to exist as an organization. Uh, so all that's also a pitch for membership. There's membership information on your table. Also on your table is some information about some of our upcoming programs and programs in general. The main downtown center conference is coming up May 1st in Brunswick. There's a flyer on your table. There's also information about our Next Step Maine Employees Initiative, uh, which explains the benefits of that program. If you're an employer, we would really like it if you'd like to sign up. If you're an educational institution, we'd love you to be on board as one of our education partners. I have a, a long uh, history with the University of Maine myself, even though I've never been a student here. My grandfather worked in the kitchen here many, many years ago. And I remember coming here and bowling in the old bear's den, uh, maybe in the early 70s, would that date myself to be that old? And I think later on they got a big screen TV, which was pretty cool at the time, but I'm sure you couldn't see it much. Uh, and two of my first cousins graduated here. Uh, they were the first two in our family on my dad's side to go to college. Uh, my, one of my cousins was uh, out of the chemical engineer program and she was one of the first women to uh, graduate from that program. Uh, another one is a school teacher in VZ where she's been for 30 or 40 years. And on my wife's side, both of her parents are graduates here, and my mother-in-law, her mother, all of her siblings went here. They were a family from Winterport, and that was four siblings that all attended the University of Maine. And there's been other family members to go through here, and really, as a Washington County native, you know, this is a central place of Eastern Maine. That's funny for a guy from Washington County, but you know what I mean. We're in Eastern Maine, and certainly the University of Maine has played a role uh, in that. And uh, most recently, my wife graduated with her MFA here in Intermedia just last year. And just in the mail last week, my son received an acceptance letter from UMaine, which <laughs> we're urging him to do, but uh, he does have a pile of those. So if you know any good deals on tuition, we'd, uh, we'd appreciate that if we could sway him over uh, to where he may choose in the end. So uh, a little bit about Maine Development Foundation. We've been working over three decades for, to drive sustainable economic long-term growth for Maine. We're delighted, or excuse me, we're dedicated to building a high quality of life for all Maine people across the state, no matter where you are. We're an organization that believes in action, access, and attitude. We have a proven track record through our programming of empowering leaders, strengthening communities, and guiding public pro policy through a variety of programming, but also with information to inform not only the legislature, but the people of Maine that are involved in business, education, healthcare, and all of those things. Because we believe that the key to growth in our state is gonna be a productive workforce that is educated, healthy, living in an engaged community, or engaged in their community and their economy, can be innovative in all of those things in a vibrant downtown. And when we think of foundation and the Maine Development Foundation, those are the building blocks and the foundations that we want to build upon with our collaborators and with our many, many partners, a lot who I've seen this morning in this room, and certainly including the University of Maine. So now at this time, I'd like to invite Jim Donnelly, the Senior Vice President, the Director of Consumer Banking, uh, to come up and, and say a few words. Jim? Um, good morning. Uh, it's uh, always hard to follow an eloquent gentleman like Harold. Um, but it's uh, being the affiliation uh, with Bangor Savings and Maine Development Foundation goes back quite a while. And the dedication to the future of Maine and the vision of where Maine could be from where we are is joint. And so that support for the, the mission and the direction that Maine Development Foundation has had and the leadership that Harold is delivering to Maine Development Foundation to lead us to the future is inspiring and easy to be a part of. And for us to be here today together at the University of Maine and at the Research Center of Maine is really an exciting combination of three venerable and visionary organizations. I've only been with Bangor Savings for a little while, and I can tell you um, our commitment to our communities, 
and to the future of the state of Maine is similar enough to what Harold said that I can see the symmetry being very easy to, to match. A uh, little bit later, I'm also uh, I'm a graduate of Maine De uh, Development Foundation's Leadership Maine program in the Gamma class. Um, very good program. If you haven't been through it or you haven't had an employee go through it, it's well worth it and they all come out of it with better connections and a better understanding of that Maine, what Maine is. Um, we're going to hear shortly from Dr. Hunter, um, and I also have the pleasure of serving on the uh, University of Maine Board of Trustees, and so I've gotten to know Dr. Hunter just a little bit over the last few months, and I can't think of a better person in the state of Maine to lead the University of Maine into the future than Dr. Hunter. She has a keen intellect, and you would expect that at anybody at this level, but the energy and enthusiasm she brings to the room is electric. It's exciting. And I love being on the board when she gets up to talk. Um, I always stop what I'm doing, and if any of you know me, I mean, I'm always talking. So if I stop talking, <laughs> somebody's really interesting. Um, so uh, speaking of me talking too long and too often, um, I'll wrap it up and pass it on to, back to Harold. But I want to thank you again on behalf of Bangor Savings Bank uh, for being here. We're so excited to sponsor this event and be a, a circle leader with Maine Development Foundation. Have a good meeting. We're thrilled to have Dr. Susan Hunter with us this morning. She said to call me Sue. No, call her Sue. <laughs> Boy named Sue. <laughs> if you're old enough to think, get that joke. Yes. Yeah, yes. She said to call her Sue, and I said, call me Harold. Um, that would be fine. There's another joke. They didn't quite go off. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to thank also we have a board of uh, one of our board trust, uh, board of director members here, Darcy Maine Boynton from the city of Brewer. Uh, she joined our board this year, and we're certainly pleased to have her there on the board along with Dr. Hunter. She's a graduate of the Leadership Maine program, which we are recruiting for, as, as you know, and as there's information on your table. And she's been a good friend, friend to MDF over the years. And she's currently serving that first term along with Darcy. And we feel very fortunate to have her at the table. Before though, I just want to talk a little bit about the work that we do with the University of Maine. They're one of our major partners. Recently in 2013, MDF and the University of Maine School of Economics began partnering in a series of economic reports. You've probably seen those. Uh, the, call, you know, the quarterly reports and they're, they're issued. The last one was on energy. Uh, also, they begin partnering with us on a series of these. Uh, that, and they're based on the, our measures of growth report that we come out. The new one will be coming out next month. And we take a look at those throughout the years, uh, throughout the year, and we do the quarterly reports based on those. And we're very pleased with that partnership. And as I mentioned, we've done them on energy, but other ones have included productivity, personal income, the fiscal return on a higher education, and strategic land conservation. We've also had the opportunity to host two excellent interns at MDF. Uh, they've, they've been very uh, valuable. They've gained a lot of experience. We've learned from them, and we, we just love doing that and having their energy. Uh, the, the young lady that we had last year was, was amazing, and we know that she's going to go on to do amazing things. And we've worked for many years in collaboration with the Margaret Chase Smith Center for Public Policy. I know Mary Cathcart is here, and we thank her for all that work and others over there uh, for the research and the working with the policymakers. So to introduce, Dr. Hunter, right now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dana Humphrey from the Dean of Engineering College here at the University of Maine. Dean thank you very much, Harold, and thank you for all that, that uh, the Maine Development Foundation does for our state. It plays an absolutely critical role, and thank you and, and all the, or your team for that. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the, to the University of Maine uh, and to really let you know this is a very special year for the University of Maine. This is our 150th anniversary. If we look back to when the University of Maine started, we had only three majors, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, and agricultural arts. Why were those three majors picked? Those three majors were picked because they were absolutely critical to the future of Maine at that point in time. Now we have 200 undergraduate and graduate degrees, but the theme is the same. These are majors that are absolutely critical uh, to the future of our state, uh, our mission is to take and provide the graduates, the knowledge, and the technologies to move Maine forward. 
Now, we're located here in Orno, but our mission reaches every corner of our state. We look at the knowledge, it reaches every corner, our graduates reach every corner, uh, and, this, and examples include a company in Ashland, Maine, that makes a very innovative shingle product. Their production line was developed here at the University of Maine. We look at Texas Instruments in South Portland. Uh, that is, uh, that, the head of that is Chris Joyce, a graduate of our engineering physics program. So to, to think about what UMaine does, we reach absolutely every corner of our state. We have over 11,000 students, and a strong University of Maine is absolutely vital to the future of this state. Now with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Hunter, the first woman president of the University of Maine. Dr. Hunter became president on July 7th of last year. Prior to starting her two-year appointment as our president, she served as vice chancellor for academic affairs for the University of Maine system. She began her full-time career at UMaine in 1991 as a faculty member in the Department of Biological Sciences. At UMaine, her administrative positions included five years as the executive vice president for academic affairs and provost, uh, and what that means is she was my direct boss. Uh, <laughs> And, and one thing I can say about Dr. Hunter is she is an absolutely outstanding boss, and that's greatly, greatly appreciated. Uh, President Hunter is a cell biologist whose research focused on the structural and uh, functional aspects of, of bone cell biology. Her research work was supported by the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. She received a PhD in physiology from Penn State University and did her postdoctoral work at Case Western Reserve and at Penn State University. And I must add, Dr. Hunter, of course, is a graduate of Leadership Maine. So just one, one, more, one more plug. Dr. Hunter will be formally installed as our president tomorrow at 3 p.m. in the Collins Center for the Arts, and you're all invited. So with that, let's all welcome Dr. Susan Hunter. I was asked to talk a little bit about, you know, what. I, it said the phraseology was look, what led to my success. I'd rather just say like, how did this all happen, and 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 what sort of set me up maybe to have this, allow this to happen, to allow me to capitalize on the opportunities that uh, presented themselves. Because I think that's really what it's about. It's about taking advantage of opportunities, and and frankly being nimble enough to recognize opportunity, and then getting something out of it that sets you up for the next opportunity. So just background, I went to college at James Madison University, and, and now that place has about 18,000 students. But when I went there, it had about 4,000 students. And although it was co-ed, it was still uh, far more women than men. And the women were the leadership of the campus. So that was a plus. Um, I, I basically started, kind of got involved in, in some campus activities leadership. I was, a, uh, I was an athlete. I, um, if we had kept track of such things and did such things, I would have lettered in fencing and golf. So I don't fence anymore, although once in a while I think it might be handy. Um, <laughs> but they, they always had tips on the end. You really couldn't like skewer anybody. Um, uh, but, I, but I do still play golf, although the amount of golf I play uh, keeps going downhill with every job. So I was a much better golfer before I became a department chair. And it's been like off the cliff at, since then. Really off the cliff as provost and then president, it's just hopeless. I almost don't know which end of the club to hold anymore. And I keep threatening to go back and work on my short game um, because I won't have a long game by the time I retire. So I'm going to have to really work on my short game. Um, <clears throat> Madison College was, uh, is right off Interstate 81. It's in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Beautiful country, Skyline Drive. Uh, it was the middle of nowhere then, uh, and it did have a very strong Greek system. And I was in a sorority. In fact, I was president of a sorority. When I tell people that, they just kind of fall off their chairs laughing. Um, but I was the president of a sorority. Uh, and it probably was, it did two things. First, every week I had to run a business meeting with 40 members and several advisors. I mean, the real adults in the room were the advisors. And it, it did, and then I had to communicate with our national office every month in a, in a formal re, you know, report and sometimes on the phone. So I think it sort of got me, so it got me trained to do that kind of thing. Uh, and it also was, um, 
if I hadn't been in a Greek system then, I wouldn't have been as involved in community service. Because as, as someone just going to college, living in the dorm, I'm not saying I wouldn't have done anything, but having that, the, uh, the structure of a, of a Greek system where we each had philanthropic, we, uh, the one I was in, we went out and did picnics at a uh, home for disabled children and adults. Uh, we raised money for uh, Easter seals, I think. There was some you know, charity. We did various things on campus and did things off campus. And that, that really started because of that experience in the Greek system. So how did I end up here? Well, my husband and I were at Penn State. That's where we, uh, that's where we met. He's a plant pathologist, sort of semi-retired. He retires, and then he teaches a course for UMPI. He retires, and this summer he's filling in at the plant disease clinic uh, down on College Avenue for cooperative extension. Um, so he's, he's sort of semi-retired, I think is probably more appropriate. But we moved here 28 years ago. Uh, we had two little kids. It seemed like, although he got the real job, it seemed like it was a good idea if I came along. So I did. <laughs> um, and I started my career as an adjunct instructor in zoology. Shortly after arrival, uh, the Department of Zoology, I'd met a couple people on a visit that we made. And I was asked if I wanted to teach cell physiology. Uh, because Bruce Seidel, the late Bruce Seidel, he passed away a couple years ago, he had a grant to go to the uh, South Pole, to the Antarctic, a part of spring semester for three years in a row. And so that was when he taught that course, and they said, do you want to teach it? When I was in grad school, I never taught because I was on research money. So I agreed to this, and then I thought, oh my god, what have I agreed to? I have the foggiest idea how you do this. Don't let that stop you in anything. Um, but I did have to work really, really hard because I really didn't know how to do this. It was a 400 level course. I had great students. The, the first crop of students I had, believe me, they were very kind because it was probably clear that I really didn't have a clue how to do this. But I learned because I think I'm a relatively quick study. Maybe that's another trait. Uh, but I taught that cell physiology course for, I think, five times while I was an adjunct. Um, I taught. Uh, anatomy and physiology once or twice. I taught clinical lab methods a couple times, um, all while being an adjunct. Uh, I helped design a new course before I had a job. Um, I was on graduate committees. And to be honest, my goal was to become irreplaceable. I don't think I thought about that in January of 1987 when I started teaching. But after a little bit of time, I thought, all you got to do is work hard enough and do a lot of work that suddenly somebody goes, uh-oh. What, if we, what do we do if she's not here? And so they hired me um, to a tenure line faculty appointment, and I started that in 1991. So that's why sometimes you hear that I've been on campus for 28 years, which is true, but my full-time job started in 1991. Dave and I had wonderful careers here. I mean, I'm still having one. Um, we loved living here. Our kids loved growing up in Orono. Uh, we never had a desire to be anywhere else. So all this time, things just kept unfolding. And I have had a bunch of jobs. My, my first uh, administrative job was uh, as an assistant director uh, for life sciences in the College of Natural Sciences, Forestry, and Agriculture. Uh, Bruce Wiersma hired me into that job. And from day one, he gave me access to the inner workings of the college. And the first thing he did was he made uh, Jan give me the budget book. She was a little nervous. She didn't exactly like the idea of this person she didn't know being given. I mean, every dime in the college, he wanted me to understand how we did this. And, but she grew to love me. She really did. Uh, she was just a little nervous at first. Um, then I went on for you know, that, and I was associate chair. I'm looking back at Ellie Groden sitting here. I was chair of the department. Ellie was the associate chair. I went on to be associate provost and then provost, and then, then my 10-month sabbatical at the University of Maine system office, uh, which was in the privacy of this room with this very small group of people. It was really boring. <laughs> <laughs> it just was. It was a three-story office building. No campus, no students. It just doesn't have the energy. Sorry. Everybody can tell the chancellor that, but it's OK because I've already told them that. <laughs> um, but you know, there are some pluses and minuses of having your whole career in one place. Certainly a minus, people might say, I'm too narrow. I've, I've only experienced one institution, one way of doing things. And that's where uh, a variety of professional development opportunities come into play. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention a couple of them in a minute. 
I think the plus, though, is that I really, um, I am so familiar with this place, I can basically stand at my desk and figure out who to call on the phone and actually sometimes remember their phone number. So it's sort of like I'm out there. I'm looking at all of you, those of you who actually work here. Um, this is a state that prizes relationships immensely, and I have tons of them. And that is a real help because it's not only calling people on campus, it's, it's communicating out across the state. And I think because I know the place at a level that's really granular and, and thinking of the people I work with on a daily basis, I'm looking at the provost, I'm, I'm sure there are times he wishes I would just walk away from that. <laughs> Way too granular. <laughs> but I think that, um, that what that allows me to do is really think about the whole institution and make connections uh, between elements that are really disparate and dissimilar and to me they're not because I just I, it's all part of this mosaic um, I think I see the place in a way that most presidents can't and that's not a criticism of our any of our presidents it's that usually they come here from somewhere else they haven't spent years here there's there's no way they can know it from the bottom up the way I do they just it, it's just not possible I had great mentoring. I mentioned Bruce Wiersma hiring me for my first job. Um, my grad school advisors were fabulous, and some of you have heard me talk about them before. Uh, I had a husband and wife team. Harold was a cell biologist. Rosemary was a biochemist. Um, and she went on to have her career as a provost and a president. And, and just, you know, when you, and we got to be very close, um, almost almost like extended family. Um, not as a student, but later when we moved back to Penn State after being out of, lived in Ohio for a couple of years, our, our children knew them almost like, other grand, uh, like another set of grandparents. They were the people that could go to daycare and pick up our kids without us phoning the daycare. So that they were, they were that, you know, we had filled out the form. So if they showed up, the kids just happily went off with them. Um, Rosemary was, quite honestly, the most magnificent woman I've ever met in my life. Um, she, she just was smart, uh, creative. Uh, she had a great way with people, all of these things that I think about. And, and as I'll say tomorrow, I probably don't go more than a day or two without thinking about her. And she died suddenly 23 years ago. I mean, she had that much of an impact on me. How she uh, approached problems, how she expressed herself, how she thought about crafting a solution that had many parts to it, how to take the long view on issues, how to think about planning a communication strategy. All of those things in the years I knew her, all of those things um, were things that we talked about. And she viewed me as someone who would go into administration. She really did. Uh, and having a mentor and being that close to someone who was the president of a university, although I didn't move to Orono, Maine, thinking I'd be the president of the University of Maine. It, because she was, it become, you know, it's sort of a real thing. Well, you know, I have a really good friend who's a university president. Well, I guess I could be that too. Why not? Um, to this day, I do consult uh, someone. Sam Smith is a very good friend of mine. Sam was the president of Washington State University for 15 years, a very successful land-grant president. I, he, he and I have known each other since I was a master's degree student at Penn State. Uh, had a great visit last summer when I was in Seattle. But Seattle is where our son lives. Um, I talked to him on the phone just two weeks ago. So no matter where you are and where you are in the, the hierarchy, there are always people to talk to, and there's always a wise head or two out there that uh, you should consult. Now, professional development opportunities. Um, I'll mention two. Uh, the USDA program, uh, SCOP, ACOP, and I forget what the initials stand for, so we'll just leave it as USDA. But that was a program that Bruce Wiersma sent me to. And it was really designed for people that will end up in leadership positions in colleges like NSFA. It was really about becoming a dean, which I didn't become, and for a while it kind of annoyed Bruce, but, but he got over it when I became provost. So... Um, <laughs> um, but, but that was a great experience. And, and the one thing I'll reflect on, we, we were assigned to color teams, and I was red. And we spent the week really in our small group, in our 20-person color team. 
And at the end, one of the exercises we did, which I thought, and I still think of this as one of the most fascinating exercises you could imagine, we were like a subgroup of us red folks were paired up with a subgroup of the green folks. And our goal was, in three hours, plan the merger of a land-grant university and a historically black college and figure out what are the elements it would take to merge those two kinds of institutions, which I thought that, that's just a fabulous exercise. Another one I'll mention is Leadership Maine, which has been mentioned several times. And I really enjoyed Leadership Maine. I was in Pi class, so it was 2008, 2009. Uh, by that time, I was definitely on the administrative track. I, was, I had just become provost in, uh, in late April, and I'll mention something in a second that's sort of funny about that, but in late April of uh, 2008. And it was clear I was staying in Maine. We loved living here. And it's also clear that it, it's the, more, the longer time you spend in Maine, and certainly any job, significant higher level job you have at the university, understanding the state, understanding the various sectors, and making connections across the sectors of Maine is absolutely essential. You, you can't, you, I, can, I can no, long, no more be president of the University of Maine and not understand the rest of the state than you know, I could fly to the moon. You really have to be connected horizontally. Oh, the, the funny thing about being, becoming provost is um, uh, Bob Kennedy asked me to step into that job, and, and uh, that, was, that was great, and I agreed. And the provost who was here was going to stay on for like six more weeks, and then she decided that she really needed to step out faster. She was moving on to a presidency, needed to be free far sooner. So suddenly I was going to become provost in like seven days, not six weeks. And, <laughs> And uh, that was fine. So, you know, I'm not going to know more in six weeks than I actually do now, so it'll be fine. <laughs> and, um, but I woke up one morning and I thought, oh, now here's a problem. I'm one of the marshals at commencement. And as the provost, I'm actually on the stage at commencement. We got to think that are there other things that are physically not going to work out logistically? <laughs> <laughs> um, I am asked, you know, what advice do I give to students? And, um, it, it is pretty simple. I say, you've really got to find something that you enjoy, uh, because then you'll work at it, because you have to work hard. And I, I had a group of students in my office a couple months ago, and I said, this sounds really you know, not very creative. But actually, successful people work very hard. I mean, the, you know, you just have to work hard. Uh, that, that isn't the only thing, but it certainly is, uh, is key. Uh, and, and I'll admit, a few years ago, not a few, many years ago, as a student, um, I had a few bumps on the road because I just didn't work hard enough at something. And when I figured that, I was like, well, the, talk about the light going off. It's like, well, you just have to work at this. Then you avoid those problems. And pretty much, I work very hard. And it's not that I avoid problems. Problems seem to land on me. But I avoid the, prob the self, um, I'd say, self-created problems by not being prepared and not being up to speed and, and not doing my homework, uh, which was pretty much the problem I ran into as a student. Uh, so there are no shortcuts. Now, what are some characteristics that I think might have helped? Um, I think I am comfortable with a high degree of ambiguity. I live in the village of ambiguity, pretty much. Um, <laughs> we have a, it's a varied and very complex landscape uh, across the campus, across the university system, across the state. And, and I think I have a pretty good ability to sort of do high-level scanning and then when I need to, you know, kind of drill in and pay attention and, and really focus on something and not intensely focus on 5,000 things all the time because you just can't do that. As I said, I think I make connections between things that seem dissimilar and disparate, and that's just because I know this place so well. Uh, I do, I'm always attuned to the fact that there is a certain hum of uh, uncertainty and I wouldn't say discontent, but uncertainty and nervousness and that's okay. I realized a few years ago, um, I am always going to feel some anxiety, I guess, when I leave for work in the morning. And that's just normal. Uh, you just cannot have these kind of jobs and, and be you know, blissfully ignorant of the disaster that's just looming out there. <laughs> um, and I think I'm fairly approachable. Um, I'm also comfortable in public. And I'm comfortable living in 
in Maine and being recognized as I move around the state. A few years ago, I remember going to Freeport, sneaking the way to Freeport to shop. I ran into a Board of Visitor member, two key of undergrad student leaders, and a faculty member. And I was only in town for an hour and a half, and I don't live there. Um, and, and really getting recognized, that's fine. If you, if you crave anonymity, uh, you, a person could not be comfortable being the president of the University of Maine. Uh, it's, it's, it's just too public a job. And it's not, I mean, if we lived in New York City, nobody would pay attention to me as a university president. But in Maine, they do. So that's OK, too. Uh, I was supposed to think a little bit about leadership. And, I, and this I'll say tomorrow. I, I found a definition of leadership that I really like because it des derives, it talks about leadership as really being derived from influence. And it can come from anyone at any level playing any role. I do have influence. I admit that. It's been built up over many years, um, long working relationships, I think good work, um, many jobs. I'm, I, I like this focus on leadership because it really doesn't rely on prominence of, the, of a person's position. Um, people all over campus are leaders and should be leaders. And that, that, that's what makes a place work. There can't, it's not just a couple people who are leaders. You need a community of leaders to actually have it be functional. And it's true, as you move up the organization, you gain power. Um, but I think you gain a lot more authority by using less power. And I think if you lead by, um, hopefully by example, uh, but by persuasion, by, by collecting people around what's the, what is in the collective best interest of you know, the department, the college, the university, the system, the state, whatever, whatever landscape you're, you're talking about. If you can get people focused on what is in the collective best interest, knowing that, in doing that, and in defining whatever that is, some people will feel like they're not getting what they want, and somebody else will get what they want. And, and it's, it's that constant push-pull that goes on all the time. And um, I think that's a more reliable way to, leave, to lead. And that's really all I've got. So now you should ask me questions. <laughs> okay, the first one, and in fact, yesterday, Car is Carol, Carol had to take off, didn't she? Okay, Vice President Kim uh, had a, led a panel or organized a panel discussion yesterday, and that the element of, of uh, women in high positions in universities was mentioned. Just last week, the Chronicle of Higher Education came out with a study, a report. One in four college presidents is, women, is, is a woman. Um, that's 25%. That's not... That's not a very high number. It is an improvement over 1986 when it was 10%. And, and you know, there are a number of reasons. Uh, some of them are cultural. Um, some of them are perhaps self-imposed. Uh, the one that I thought of yesterday was that uh, if a woman decides to become a college president, you, you can't go, you probably are not going to go from being a faculty member to a president in one or even two steps. You have to start early enough to allow yourself the time to get there. But it's definite that there are, there are impediments. And I think they're cultural. I think they're social. Um, one of the things that we, and I'm looking back at Ellie, and there's other members of the, and Amy Freed is here, and I don't know who else exactly. But the advance grant that we, uh, we obtained a number of years ago is about, um, it, the grant was from NSF, so it technically it focuses on you know recruiting, advancing, retaining, promoting all of those things. Women in STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, and social and behavioral sciences. But part of that is building up women and and having more women, frankly, in the pipeline, and also identifying women and providing opportunities for women to gain the leadership skills and experiences, so they they will grow and and then be selected for positions. Um, and in fact, we're fundraising. But I won't go into that. That would just be <laughs> crass commercialism. <laughs> I'll let Jeff Mills talk about that. So if you want to know about that, talk to Jeff Mills. I want somebody to be crass. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, he can be crass. Well, the foundation is a separate entity. So yeah. no. um, it, it, the two-year term. Now that, uh, I'm not going to say much on that. I mean, I agreed to, I, I said I would do a two-year term because I was planning to retire then. But to be quite honest, it keeps coming up. So I'm just going to 
I'm not saying anything. <laughs> I do not want. I, I, I do not want to work on forever because, as I've said, I want to work on my short game. <laughs> um, no, my husband is retired. So there, there, eventually there's a disconnect and I want to retire because, um, you know, but who knows. You want to get your long game back. Yeah, while well, I still have the muscles to actually, you know, <laughs> doing push-ups every day, trying to hang on to my upper body strength. You know? <laughs> It's not that no one leaves, but the, the brain drain, I think, is a, is a little overplayed. Now, the one thing I, I will say is that um, although I want students to stay, and I think there are plenty of opportunities, um, I, I think the way that, that Maine will uh, enhance itself is by collecting more people of, frankly, a younger demographic. We are the state with the oldest median age, and we really need to, to harvest some people a lot younger than me. Uh, and uh, certainly the governor is aware of that too. And, and because this is the workforce of the future is not going to be the people in this room. The other thing though is I like, I do encourage students because many of them want to leave. I said leave and then come back. But you know, I sometimes worry that students, there are, there's an element of I don't want to leave because I'm afraid to leave. And that's what I don't want. It, you know, uh, somebody who's afraid of experiencing another life, other culture, other experiences, they're not giving, they're not providing to the state of Maine everything it needs. So I like to have people have varied experiences and then come back and build something here based on that and, and pretty much based on the fact that once you live somewhere else, you want to live in Maine. And, and you, you sort of don't know that until you go somewhere else. Well, we actually have a leadership minor that has been started, really started out of the business school. Is that right, Jeff? If I got the... Business and uh, the other part was uh, political science. Well, political science, the uh, Cohen Institute for Leadership and Public Service. But I think there are opportunities for, for students on campus to actually take courses now that really focus on leadership, and talking about leadership, and, and thinking about what does it mean to be a leader, what's a good preparation for moving as your career advances, what do you think about as you move from position to position, what, what, are, what are some ethical uh, concerns when it comes to leadership. Well, I think there's, there's no uh, denying that the university system, the, 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 uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, we have a University of Maine system. It has, uh, the structure is we have a chancellor who's Jim Page, we have a board of trustees, and Trustee Donnelly is sitting right here. The, the board is the actual governance and fiduciary authority, financial authority for the whole University of Maine system. Within the system, we, had, we have seven separate universities. This is the, the land grant, the flagship campus, the, uh, the, the biggest campus, has the highest student population, awards the, the graduate degrees, has a $100 million research enterprise. But then, then we have the University of Southern Maine, and then there are five other smaller campuses, ranging you know, much smaller, say less than 1,000 students. With this whole system, there's no doubt, you've, you all read the newspaper, we are struggling with how we will be ultimately um, organized, and I said it in Florida, and I'll say it here, I think ultimately we will end up being an, a single university entity. We will be the University of Maine. Um, somebody asked me that the other day, and I said, and this is no reflection on any other location, but you, you wouldn't call this whole enterprise the University of Maine at Skowhegan. So obviously it has to all be the University of Maine. We don't have a campus at Skowhegan, that's why I picked that town. I was just, <laughs> just, just in case you didn't realize that. It's like, uh oh, you know, I'll invent a university that we don't have. That's what. <laughs> um, but I think we will ultimately end up as a single entity, uh, the University of Maine, and it, and it, will be, um, it will be a challenge to get there, but there will be some opportunities for some, some significant steps. And I think it will allow us to, um, uh, I'd say, work statewide in a way that we don't now. We, we still are seven separate entities. We build our budgets in, in very separate silos. We, um, we need to align ourselves. We need to align a, a number of our operations and not replicate ourselves seven times over. We have a lot of stuff on this campus. It's, it's no secret. We've got all kinds of enterprise. We have all kinds of, uh, of the facilities management, uh, environmental safety. Those folks are already uh, really connected to the other campuses and ha helping out. 
because you know, we're faced with a significant structural gap that's not going away uh, at, at any great speed. And when you look at, and we're so appreciative of the increase in the state appropriation that looks like it will come to pass. But in reality, that appropriation has been flat or even slightly declining over a period of, of years. Uh, In-state tuition is held constant for another year. Another, the trustees are, are committed to that, and I admire them for it. But if you, if you do hold both those things constant, more or less, and cost has to go up, we all know that cost goes up, if you're not robustly enrolled, and that's a problem, you're going to have a structural gap. You're going to have a gap between revenue and expenses, and we have to find a way to wrestle that into submission. So I think we will look different in five years, whether I'm here or not. <laughs> well, I think some of the integration, uh, I, I can't, it's hard for me to say how the communities will integrate. Uh, I, I have to start at the level of the university first. But I really think as we, uh, as we become this, uh, I'll say a coalesced university, how's that for nuance? Um, I think you'll actually see more opportunities for connections between the campuses because we won't be separate entities to as great an extent. And I think it will actually provide a lot more opportunity for students. Uh, I think, uh, and something, and I'll actually say it tomorrow, I think on this campus we see our research enterprise and, and certainly outreach uh, as a statewide entity, and we, we operate um, not only statewide, but nationally and internationally in terms of our research portfolio. And, and students are all over the place. I mean, we get students all over the state doing projects. But if we actually think about how we could then do more of that with students at the other, at the other campuses, it would enhance our ability to, to serve the state's needs because we'd have more people deployed, to be honest. Uh, and it would actually enhance their student experience because some connection to us would actually be beneficial. That's not a criticism of the faculty at any of those campuses, but we just have a, we have a portfolio uh, that no one else has and we sh they should be able to experience it. And I think it would be an advantage. Well, I, I mean, I try to do what I said, <laughs> um, but I think it's about communication. It's about um, allowing people to make decisions. Hopefully they've talked some of them over with me. Um, it, it's holding people accountable. It's figuring out what worked and what didn't. Uh, and then it's, it's figuring out a way forward if something sort of fell off the rails and being pretty direct about it. I, I'd like to think I'm a fairly clear, uh, direct communicator. Um, maybe that's from being a scientist and making up a lot of like to-do lists. This, to, step one, step two, step three, you know. You can't do step three in the experiment before step one. Uh, but it's those kind of things. But most of it, I think it boils down to communication, how you communicate. Well, actually, I would, I would do Leadership Maine. Uh, I, I, have you done that yet? Okay, well, we can connect you with someone to do, to do Leadership Maine. Because what it, yeah, what it does is it does just that. It connects you to a cadre of people, your whole class, and they're in all different sectors, economic sectors of the state, nonprofit, hospitals, I mean, maybe somebody from the university system, the government, governmental agencies. So you, you get to meet people in all these sectors. And pretty much, uh, when you do Leadership Maine, once you get over having to hold hands and form a circle the first day, which was a little bit of a stretch for me, <laughs> I have to admit. Uh, but once you get over that part, what you realize is if you, if, if, if you reach out to somebody in your leadership main class, they pretty much will just drop everything and pay attention to you. I need help on this. You send that out to your leadership main class, you'll get help. I mean, there's sort of this commitment that everybody makes to, to really step up to one another, for one another. So you should do leadership main. It's a great way to uh, understand the state and, and position yourself, uh, whether you're in the job you're going to stay in for your whole life, or you want to think about other jobs, that's a great network uh, to establish. Um, Don't leave. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there are opportunities. There are certainly opportunities in the university system because we are, you know, we're all aging. Uh, and, and then it's, I think it's about taking advantage of opportunities and seeing that at every step in the way, along the way, there's something to be gained. 
And you have to sort of figure out, so what did I gain from this? So to be honest, I think I gained a lot from being president of a sorority and then teaching Bio 100. Bio 100 was one of, is one of the biggest classes on campus. And um, you, you gave the lecture, you, you, we team taught it, so, but, but you gave the lecture and then had an hour to, uh, to like recycle your head, and then you gave the lecture again. Um, a lot of technology, didn't always work, had to be sort of nimble. Had, the first day I taught that class, and I had taught a lot before I taught it, the first day I gave the lecture, I thought, uh-oh, I have to give the lecture in an hour, and it has to match exactly. Because we make the tests up, and we don't, I don't sit there and think, oh, geez, I gave this little example at 9 o'clock, but I didn't do it at 11 o'clock, so I can't ask the 11 o'clock people that question. It forced me to become a lot more organized. And so if I could bring these two lectures in within a minute of one another, home run. But, you know, it's stuff like that and figuring out, so how did that make me better later on? And so I think it is looking at every opportunity and every job you have as, so what, what's the takeaway from this? Because there's a takeaway from all of it. Whether, I mean, even, you know, disaster, there's a takeaway. I mean, the disaster, you know, little disasters here and there. I've never had huge disasters, I'll be honest. But the little disasters set you up to not make those mistakes again. International. Oh, internationally. Well, I've stu I, I have traveled. Uh, I've been to Europe. I've been to New Zealand twice. I've been to Abu Dhabi. Uh, so I think it just, and traveling around the country. I love going to other cities to, to frankly experience the diversity that you don't see in Maine. Uh, and so my advice to students here is to get out, whether you travel, whether they can travel internationally, a lot of our students can't afford it, but I really want them to travel around the country because there's a, an awful lot of the United States that doesn't look like, sound like, act like Maine. And in order to, to, to be comfortable in a, in a global economy, I think you have to develop a comfort zone with different cultures. It won't be your culture, but at least you have to be able to ride along with it, understand it, take something from it, you know, see the beauty of it, ask some questions. And so I would encourage students to move around more uh, because I think that really is beneficial. And it certainly, I think, it helped me. Um, uh, well, I'll, years ago, when, um, when I was provost, Bob Kennedy was president, and uh, he asked me what job I enjoyed the most. And I said at the time, certainly being provost was the most interesting and challenging. Every job I've liked better, I thought, or every job I appreciated because I like a bigger landscape. Apparently, I want to control, like, run the world. But anyway, <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, and I told him at the time that, that was, provost was the most interesting, but my favorite job was being chair of my department. I'm looking back at Ellie. And, and, I, and I said this, and, and I said, this'll, that'll never change. It, it has now changed. My favorite job is being president of the University of Maine. And I think it's because of the diverse, I get to be out and about, I get to meet a lot of people, of, I have wonderful experiences, um, and, and I just enjoy that. So this is my favorite job. <laughs>